Greetings yet again to each and all, those who still care and dare to listen, and a wicked welcome to Mythophrenia, where you find talks and texts by Gnostic teacher John Lamlash on a range of topics relevant to the Terma of Gaia Awakening, the Sophianic view of life, Planetary Tantra, and the Calico War Party. I am recording this talk on the 20th of October, 2016, under the title, The Great Deception, Part 2, with the subtitle, Handling Supernatural Power, and a sub-subtitle, if you will, Gnostic Orientation to Human Evil and Demonic Powers. The notes uh, and text uh, associated with this talk uh, present a follow-up to the previous talk, The Great Deception, Part 1. You will recall that the previous talk highlights an event in the religious history of the human species, if you will. Granted that the Abrahamic religions... Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have had, and some would say continue to have, a massively preponderant effect upon the human mind. Granted that they have had a tremendous impact upon human behavior as seen in the record of history. This being so, it would not be foolish to consider an incident in the narrative of the Abrahamic religions. And not just any incident, but the incident that describes the founding moment of those three religions. There is a term in comparative mythology, foundation myth. And the term foundation myth is used to apply to the myth or narrative or body of legends identified by any particular culture, be it the Navajo, be it the ancient Chinese, be it the Japanese, be it the Aztecs, which describes the moment when their culture was founded it describes the moment when their identity was established. For instance, the moment when the Aztecs first arrived in the valley of Mexico, beneath the twin volcanoes of Popo, Catopeto, and Ixpapaloto. At that moment, when they arrived in the place where they would later found the great city of Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs established their history, their identity, their culture. And so the description of that event is called a foundation myth. The foundation myth of the Abrahamic religions can be found in chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Genesis, where the mysterious and somewhat eerie figure called Melchizedek presents himself to Abraham the patriarch and founder of those religions, according to the generally accepted story. It is absolutely imperative in any discussion of the supernatural forces that might be operating in a harmful, nefarious, and deceitful way upon the planet today. Absolutely imperative to hold this incident and this legend in the forefront of your mind. The previous talk highlighted a point that is well worth reiterating. This incident can be considered in the generic category of a divine intervention, an intercession of a divine presence into the human world in the generic category yes you can place it there 
but it must be marked by a very large blinking asterisk to indicate that it is a freak event. It is an anomalous case of supernatural intervention, of supernatural intrusion, but it is not, strictly speaking, a case of divine intervention because Melchizedek does not represent the genuine power of the divine. So as the text that goes along with this talk explains, this biblical legend of Abraham's meeting with the, quote, three angels has been widely depicted in world art. The Russian Jewish painter Mark Chagall did a canvas dedicated to that theme. This legend stands as evidence of a singular and outstanding case of an alien supernatural force breaking into human reality. Does that mean to say that there was never any other instance in which an alien harm-intending force intruded into human reality? Well, let me answer that question. That's a valid question. Let me answer that question with two answers. The first answer is, there may well have been, but that remains to be discovered and verified. Second answer is, whether or not there were other cases, or reports of other cases, or seeming reports of presumed cases of evil intrusion into human reality, if this one cannot be detected and defeated, then it doesn't matter how many of them you know about. So consider those two answers carefully. The exposition coming to you on the Great Deception underscores this point over and over again. With the meeting between Melchizedek and Abraham, a process of demonic intrusion began a long, long-term process of demonic intrusion, which in fact had a very long period of preparation ahead of it, before it in time, even previous to that meeting. But from the moment of that meeting on, which can be placed arguably, provisionally speaking, if you accept the time work, uh, the time frame of biblical scholarship, around 1800 B.C.E. were clearly in historical time. You can place this intrusion in the framework of the provisional time scheme of history, even though we might say, well, that time scheme is, is not valid. And it doesn't matter. It's just a working time frame. And so, this unique intrusion persisted through history where it can be traced and tracked and it persists today in current events manifesting vividly and palpably in ways that are unlike any other such presumed intrusion of alien demonic forces. Thanks to the Gnostic intel salvaged out of the Greek Coptic writings there is a basis for building up a profile on this particular form of evil. To the Gnostics, this particular event was known, was seen as a moment, crucial moment, in the process of archontic intrusion upon the divine experiment with humanity on the planet Earth. That is the exact syntax. So this event deserves special attention, scrutiny, and evaluation. And the Gnostic view of the Melchizedek incident is the primary mental requirement 
that comes to you if you choose to learn how to detect and engage supernatural powers that are operating right here, right now. If you choose to learn about what supernatural really is and what evil is and how it relates to the supernatural, you cannot do so without holding this incident and its significance in the forefront of your attention. This demonic intrusion has been ongoing through, ongoing through history and is currently playing out in its end game phase. Contrasted to that, there is a second example, a second instance, which is a genuine and novel event of divine intervention, truly divine intervention, underway on this planet since March of 2011. The first is the archontic intrusion, which is demonic, and the latter is the divine intervention of the planetary Aeon Sophia, which is called correction. So you can't see one without seeing the other. You can't participate consciously in correction without facing the archontic intrusion in all of its features and consequences. Strange as it may sound, bizarre as it may appear, the so-called Mandela effect brings attention directly and frontally to the alien demonic intrusion, putting it in your face. In Gnostic terms, the bizarre phenomenon of the Mandela effect really ought to be called the correction effect. Of course, this talk is not a place to elaborate on the Mandela effect. That material is reserved for other writings and other talks to appear on mythophrenia. However, it is worth noting, just briefly, that Christians today, who hold to the view of the Great Deception, and who sincerely believe that they are exposing and ex opposing the Great Deception, or the work of Satan against God. Christians today, many of them, millions probably, hold the view that the Mandela effect is evidence of Satan's attempt to deceive humanity. They are convinced that this bizarre phenomenon is evidence that satanic powers and supernatural powers opposed to God and Jesus are meddling with the human mind and meddling with memory. But what you need to consider right now and hold uh, in your mind as steadily as you can is the proposition that the Mandela effect exposes the archontic factor working on the human mind. It is as if you had a case of an FBI agent who was attempting to uh, expose a certain crime, let's say some racketeering having to do with trafficking of young girls. And this FBI agent is attempting to expose that racketeering crime, how tragic it would be and how stupid it would be to mistake 
the FBI agent, as being an accomplice or perpetrator of the crime which he is in fact exposing. The Mandela effect is not evidence of a satanic working of black magic upon human mind and memory. It is in fact a supernatural phenomenon of a benevolent source that is bringing human attention to the archontic intrusion and its current day operations in an unparalleled manner. In an unparalleled manner. It is in fact the deal breaker as far as bringing human attention to the satanic alien archon factor goes. So I'll leave that there, not to digress too far into the Mandela effect, and proceed with the definition of the supernatural. How about that? It's about time to put out a definition of the supernatural. Like all definitions, as Socrates advised in the Georgius, This one is simply of a provisional value offered so that a dialogue can take place using it as a tool of the dialogue. It's not absolute. It's not written in stone. It's pretty damn good. It's pretty elegant and simple and deep. But like all definitions, it's simply a provisional tool that allows a dialectic and dialogue process to unfold. Also, bear in mind that throughout the textual material on this subject, you will find the supernatural sometimes written with a capital S and other times written with a small s in which it might be used as an adjective. The capital S signifies the aspect of the supernatural as a power and presence of a transhuman nature. It deserves to be capitalized just as the word God is always capitalized. God is spelled with a capital G to suggest an agency, presence and power that is beyond the world somehow present to the world, depending on whether you're a theist or a deist, etc., etc. Well, likewise, for the capitalization of supernatural. And when it's not capitalized, it's virtually interchangeable with the word paranormal. So, ready for a definition? Supernatural, equivalent to Nahual, is the totality of extrasensory phenomena of the natural world co-emergent with the psychic activity of the human animal. End quote. Now it would be helpful to point out that during the 1990s in the United States of America, a certain movement emerged, and it didn't last long. It was kind of a flash in the pan, and it was called Echo-Psychology. Its leading exponent was Theodore Rosak, R-O-S-Z-A-K, who brought out a book by that name. Well, it so happens that the basic premise of Echo-Psychology had already been defined and, in fact, developed quite elaborately by another individual during the 1980s. So a good 10 years before Rosak put the term eco-psychology on the map, the course of alchemical studies given in Santa Fe prefigured that movement and that worldview. And what essentially is the feature of eco-psychology, that is, necessary for an approach to the supernatural? Well, it's very, very simple. The alchemical course presented in Santa Fe stated as one of its premises, and there were four or five 
basic founding principles that the problem with psychology up until then was that the psyche did not have a habitat. The psyche and the operations of the psyche happen, right? You visualize uh, something. You have reverie. You have the act of imagination. But where does the act of imagination happen? Generally speaking, it is assumed that imagination and other events in the human psyche happen in inner space. But the alchemical course of 1982 and the movement in Beko psychology a good decade or more later both asserted otherwise. They asserted that all of the operations that you define as belonging to your psyche, your emotional imaginative life, actually occur in nature just as much as the blooming of the daisies and the flight of the cranes and the grazing of the horse in the pasture. Putting psyche in its habitat was one of the objectives of that course and is today, continues to be, an objective of Gaian alchemy. Well, you can see that premise reflected in this definition. This definition states that the natural world, the processes of nature in their totality, are co-emergent with the psychic activity of the human animal. So your psychic life lives in the natural world as much as any natural process. When you begin to understand how it does so, then you are getting some tread on the question of supernatural powers. The supernatural, capital S, can also be considered simply as an extension of the natural world. It, 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 and it comprises those dimensions which support and produce the natural world. So when you stand in, in a rose garden and you look at all the roses around you and the ground that they're growing out of and the bees and the insects that are flying around them, that phenomenon of nature, the rose garden, is actually founded upon the supernatural. The supernatural is what makes the natural happen. The supernatural and the natural are a continuum. But the supernatural has to be defined as such because according to the limits and parameters of your sensory perception, you cannot directly perceive the supernatural under ordinary circumstances. The appearance of the planet Earth before your eyes is a supernatural event. And bear in mind that the primary mark of the supernatural is beauty. Awesome and overwhelming beauty. You might think of the natural world in terms of a fountain, and this analogy was often used and highly favored by the alchemists of Europe during the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. The original image of the fountain can be found in Gnostic writings where the vision of the organic light is compared the beholding or encounter with the organic light is compared to standing before a fountain. When you stand before a fountain, you see, let's say, the round uh, limits of the fountain, and then you see the, uh, the vertical part of the fountain, and then the water flowing out of that and dropping back down into the water below, being enclosed by the circular part of the fountain. Well, the circular part of the fountain can be considered as the, the limits of the natural world. And when you look at the part of the fountain where the water is erupting, that is like looking at the current activity of nature as it unfolds right in front of your eyes. It is erupting. Nature is con continually erupting. But where is it erupting from? 
just as the water that you see visibly coming out of the top of the fountain becoming visible as it erupts from the top of the fountain just as that water is coming from a source underground all the erupting or emergent phenomena of nature are coming from a source in the supernatural. There is nothing to be afraid of in the supernatural. If you think the natural world is beautiful, you should see the supernatural world. The foundation of everything that exists materially is beauty and love. Period. There is no evil anywhere in the supernatural, but there are alien and predatory supernatural forces operating upon earth for particular reasons due to very particular events. And the fallen goddess scenario, the sacred narrative of the mysteries, describes the course of events which brought about the anomalous situation in which humanity is targeted, has come to be targeted by alien predatory forces who may generally consider to be supernatural. But they are not sourced in the supernatural matrix that produces nature and all species, including the human species. No, the archons are not sourced in that matrix. The archons are an anamu, anomaly. They are an inorganic species who have a different source. The challenge of the Gnostic intel, which is the only intel on the planet that can really enlighten you on these matters is to get your mind clear to what it's telling you. And that clarity brings clarity to everything else that you can or need to know about the supernatural. It comes to us today as extremely good fortune. It comes as what I would call true felicity to learn that the correct approach to the supernatural was pioneered over 200 years ago by a famous German romantic, a poet and a naturalist named Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Now, the method of Goethe for observing nature has been called intensive observation. And if you're really serious about the supernatural, if you really want to learn not only what it is from someone who encounters it directly, firsthand, all the time, and at will, and can navigate there in the Nahual, if you want to learn from the benefit of expert experience with the supernatural, and eventually encounter it yourself, then you absolutely must inform yourself about the method of intensive observation of Goethe. That method is really the model and setup for investigating the supernatural and the paranormal in a sane and sober way. You could read, for instance, the excellent book by Rudolf Steiner called Goethe the Scientist. It was written before Steiner elaborated his cultic program of anthroposophy and stands largely free of the biases of that program. Read Goethe's book on the metamorphosis of plants. Another book on this subject is The Wholeness of Nature which is heavy going but brilliant. And for a summary of excerpts from Goethe on Science, look at Goethe on Science, edited by Jeremy Nadler. Also, I must say that the Wikipedia article on Goethe's method 
of observation is not bad. What is intensive observation? Well, the example that's generally given by anyone who takes up this subject would go like this. Goethe discovered that when you go out and you look at something in nature, such as a rose, the content of the sense impressions that you receive through your sense organs only represents a small fraction of the phenomenon in front of you. So there you are. Let's say you're sitting in a rose garden and there's a glorious rose bush beside you with a big blossom. You see it. You observe its color. You smell it. You may feel the texture of the leaves. You may hear a bee buzzing around it. You may almost be able to taste the scent of the rose in the air. Or if there is dew on the rose and you take a drop of dew on the tip of your finger and taste it, there you've engaged all your five senses in the perception of this rose. But no matter how long you sit there and how deeply you, you absorb the beauty of this rose, your sense organs are giving you impressions that you only register at a surface level. If you go more intensively into what your sense organs are showing you, that is called intensive observation. In the course, in the alchemy course in the 1980s in Santa Fe, it was called infrasensory observation. Infrasensory, within the senses. If you go within the senses, deeper, then more and more of the phenomena reveals itself to you. And eventually there is a boundary that you cross and you are no longer perceiving what is merely, merely, I mean it's a vast range of phenomena, but you are no longer perceiving what is limited to normal sense perception, but you're delving into the depths of sense perception, and there you encounter the supernatural. Now bear in mind always that there are two modalities of the supernatural which tend to mingle with each other. They're like two chemicals that mingle and merge. One of them is the supernatural coming to you through your senses observing the external world. The other is the supernatural coming to you through your psyche, through your inner intuition, your thoughts, emotions, reveries, dreams, memories. The supernatural operates and extends into both those realms and stands behind both those realms. So by all means, if you take yourself seriously regarding an investigation of the supernatural, to I become initiated into supernatural powers? Start with learning about the intensive observation method of Goethe, because that is fundamentally the method that you will use to reach toward the supernatural. Clear? Now, it might be objected at this point, or the objection could be raised. Well, well, that sounds, you know, fairly coherent, fairly clear. However, doesn't this intensive observation of Goethe merely apply to the phenomenon of the supernatural reaching you through the natural world, through the external realm of the senses, and not to the supernatural reaching you 
to your own psyche. And that is in fact true. And that is in fact quite correct. And if you made that observation, then you're a savvy little animal. I will simply point out that there is a complement to the Gertian method of intensive observation for the external world. There is a method and a system to practice intensive observation upon your own psychic life, to examine your memory, your fantasies, your intuitions, the images, the emotionally charged, emotionally toned images and archetypes that arise in your imagination. There is a method for observing and sorting out all of those psychic impressions. And that method is called Planetary Tantra. So the Shakti Cluster can be described in several ways. The Shakti Cluster is the central icon of Planetary Tantra. And what is the Shakti Cluster? It's a kind of a console that describes the 18 channels through which the supernatural power of the Earth operates upon you psychically. So, the Shakti Cluster and the simple practices of Planetary Tantra, such as following the moods of the lunar shifts, is a practice that counterbalances and complements the Gertian practice. The practice of Planetary Tantra largely affords you the tools and techniques for working with your psychic life and your inner life and also to some degree with the outer life because the inner and outer life of the human animal are, are both grounded in the same matrix. But in answer to that question which would naturally arrive, yes, which would naturally arise, yes, there is a way, there is a method for your psychic life equivalent to Goethe's method. It comes out of the terma of Gaia awakening and is in fact the primary tool for interactivity with the planetary animal mother, the Aeon Sophia. Moving on to the subject of dimensions. Dimensions is a word not far from dementia and there is indeed a great deal of dementia operating when you hear human animals discussing dimensions. Well, how many dimensions do you want? How many dimensions can you handle? The current text and talk proposes, again, a provisional learning model for you. This model consists of ten dimensions which can be portrayed in a simple linear formula. These ten dimensions comprise the totality of all events unfolding in all the galaxies in the universe. Universe with a capital U refers to the totality of all galaxies. Now if you would suppose, now wait a minute, oh maybe there's more than ten dimensions. If you would suppose that there are more, well you might be right. But be assured that you cannot verify that supposition unless you first access directly and master the structure of the ten dimensions shown here in this simplific linear formula. The formula can be read from left to right and right to left. When read from left to right, it expresses the ultimate view, which is called paramatya satya, or unconditional truth, as it's loosely translated. The ultimate view, which is that there is really only one dimension to the entire universe, which exists materially as an infinite, flat, unbounded plane 
which is called Laya, or called Parasamvit. Tantrikas in the Hindu tradition identified this infinite flat plane as the ground state of infinite awareness that underpins the entire universe. It is, by the way, not a plane of light, but a plane of absolute and total blackness or darkness, like obsidian. And the nine other dimensions of the universe, of the galaxies, are fractally reflected off that plane. That is the view, reading the formula from left to right. That is why there is a colon after ten. The colon means that the following nine dimensions are collapsed and internested into the tenth dimension. See, picture an unbounded flat sheet of obsidian stone with dewdrops on it. And entire world systems are reflected in these dewdrops. Galaxies populated by billions of planetary systems are reflected in these dewdrops. And these droplets are called Brahmandas, or eggs of Brahma in Vedic cosmology. So the world systems that arise in the universe are globular or dewdrop shaped. Not fixed globes, but more like the globular form of an amoeba or a living entity. And the planets arising within them are also largely, predominantly globular in shape. But the universe itself, in its totality, is flat. This is a genuine mystery and a great, deep, and perpetual mystery to be investigated and explored again and again and again. There is not time within the limitations of this talk and text to expound at length on this formula. But there it is, as a key learning tool, as you and I proceed to investigate what supernatural power really is. And let me say this once again, the only valid motive for wanting to know about supernatural power is the desire to engage it and handle it. What kind of a person would you be if you wanted to learn everything about, say, the game of chess, but never play a game of chess? If you wanted to learn everything about musical chords, acoustics, the whole history of music, the construction of musical instruments, from the clavichord to the piano to the lute to the guitar to the banjo to the ukulele, the various musical motifs, the various scales, if you wanted to learn all that and never ever play a flute, never ever play a few chords on a guitar, what kind of creature would you be? The Gnostic exposition of the supernatural coming from yours truly is intended to engage you in it so that you learn to detect it and to handle it, to handle the power of the supernatural. That is the aim of this instruction. Oh, to that end, this formula of the ten-dimensional structure of the universe can prove to be helpful. And there it is for reference from time to time. Just point out, in this particular talk, what happens when you read the formula in the sense of relative or conditional truth, which is called samvriti satya, or the truth according to the semblance of impressions. 
by contrast to paramartha satya, which is the truth according to the supreme form of things. So reading from right to left, the formula places the human creature on earth in the ten-dimensional complex in this way. You inhabit three dimensions of space, which are not what you might think they are, by the way, and one dimension of time. So the human animal living on the earth is normally living in a four-dimensional continuum. And interfacing with that four-dimensional continuum and internesting with it, or better said, the four-dimensional continuum is internested in two other dimensions, which are the fifth and the sixth dimension, higher dimensions of the natural world. And they, in turn, are internested and embedded in the seventh dimension, which is the limit of the structural and dynamic events of the solar system. The solar system, including the Earth, Moon, and Sun, is a seven-dimensional event. But normally, the human animal only lives in four dimensions. The limit of the planetary mind itself is seven dimensions. But galactic structure and dynamics extends two more dimensions to eight and nine, and then all of that is embedded fractally in the tenth dimension. This is the simplific and elegant model to be used in learning about the supernatural. The way to get your mind around this notion of dimension, by the way, is to avoid the dementia that comes with groping after dimensions. There are no dimensions in the sense of an hypostatic structure that somehow exists independent of the events that occur within that structure. There are no metaphysical dimensions and there is no necessity to think metaphysically to understand what these dimensions are. The dimensions are simply perceptual, functional frames. They're frames. In order for the events of the universe to unfold from an infinite source with no frame and no boundary, the events must unfold through a series of framing devices, as it were. The nature of these framing devices is fantastically fascinating and mysterious. The exploration of these framing devices was an entertainment of yogis in the past. In the Hindu Tantric tradition, yogis often went into states of intensive observation of the psychic infrastructure of their own minds and the mind of the universe itself. Imagine that. Ooh. They practiced intensive observation of their own psyches first and then they penetrated deeper into the psyche of the, of the, of the planet and, to, and into the mental structure and projective structure of the galaxy and of the universe itself. And they left models of that exploration, such as the model of the 36 tattvas, which may come up in an exposition sooner or later. A dimension is simply a framing structure. It's just as if you wanted to uh, lay down a patch of concrete in your backyard so that you could have an area to play basketball. So you would frame off that area. 
and pour the concrete in within the boundaries of the frame. It's just a frame. And the name for the power that produces and generates these frames is called Mahamaya. M-A-H-A-M-A-Y-A. Maya itself does not mean illusion. It means dimension. Something that is measurable. It comes from the Sanskrit root ma, meaning to emanate in an incremental manner or to measure. So maya and dimension are practically interchangeable terms. And that force that comes out of the ground awareness of the universe itself that allows events to occur in the universe by framing them is called Mahamaya. Moving on now to the last 20 minutes or so of this oral commentary to accompany the text on the Great Deception. Here is the topic of ego or egoic lensing. The topic of egoic lensing is essential to any exploration of the supernatural. Why? Because it explains the very great fact and the self-evident fact that as you go around in life normally proceeding with your affairs, you do not normally perceive or encounter the supernatural. It's always there. And in fact, it's always impacting you. Be assured that every single day of your ordinary life, the supernatural is impacting you through those two angles. Externally, it is coming to you through the natural world, and internally, coming to you through the processes of your psychic and emotional life, your inner life. But normally you proceed as if that is not the case, don't you? How can that be? Well, that happens because you, the human animal, are designed in such a way that you have an inherent filtering device. You have an onboard filtering mechanism which actually filters out contact with the supernatural and keeps it on the outside of a certain boundary. The ego is simply a boundary forming mechanism, also a mechanism of your psyche. The ego is a product of your inner life and of your psyche. And different people have very different kinds of egos because the ego takes on the coloring and dispositions of that particular animal with his or her particular desires, his or her particular talents. But basically, the mechanism or device of egoic lensing is the same for everyone. As you function normally in the human world, you are designed to be able and disposed to create a social world around you. That's how you are designed. Human animals are social animals. Well, you could not proceed with the creation of this social world. You could not proceed with the cultivation of human relationships if you were continually dealing with the impact of the supernatural from without and within, could you? Could you? Isn't that simple enough? In fact, when you make do a shamanic practice with the intention of going directly to the supernatural in nature or allowing the supernatural to well up within your inner life, you have to step out of society. You cannot do it in the, na- in the setting of the social world. The social order is constructed by mutual effort, also by mutual aid, and by the collaboration with other human animals. The social order so constructed then becomes the theater and test setting 
for novel aspects of the divine experiment in which the human genome develops within the confines of the planetary laboratory. So the human creature, the anthropic species, finds itself in a planetary laboratory, which is nature, the earth. And part of the experiment in which it is placed, which actually makes it worthy to be called an experiment, is that the human animal has the capacity and disposition to create a social order, which is not given by nature. And it is the way that the human animal creates the social order and manages it that is of great interest to the originators of this experiment. Do you follow my drift? Social order cannot be constructed, therefore the divine experiment of the anthropine species cannot be accomplished if the members of society are continually impacted by the supernatural. So, the aeons who originated this experiment that you and I are in designed the anthropine species with a filter device of egoic lensing so that attention can be given to the social order free of the constant and highly fascinating influx from the supernatural. Well, at this point in this spoken commentary, I come to the subject of psychic reflux leading into the concluding part of the textual material covering the Great Deception. Part 2. So far, what you have, especially with the inclusion of the 10D model, is nothing less than a condensed text that could easily be expanded into a three-month collegiate course on the structure and the dynamics of the supernatural. That's a nice title for the course, The Structure and Dynamics of the supernatural. And that's quite a lot to take on board. So this would be the point at the one hour mark to round off the spoken commentary so far and to pick it up again with a continuation of a second recording going over the remainder of the material in the text that is to say, the fascinating subject of psychic reflux, the operation of the three attentions in relation to the ten dimensions, it even rhymes, and finally coming around again to the subject of evil, what actually is evil, why would anyone make the proposition that evil is exclusively a human construction and that there exists no cosmic or supernatural evil. That's a quite a powerful statement and contradicts a massive amount of presumption on the part of the human mind. Anyway... It will require a second spoken commentary to go over the remaining two parts of this text. And so that's how it shall be handled. And for now I will post this text and the first commentary simultaneously for your edification and enjoyment on mythophrenia.